income distribution and the growth rate. So at the trunk end, that's the 1%. They're still seeing growth. Here in the body of the elephant, this is the lower middle class and the develop, developing middle class. So really represented by China and India um, and the developing world. However, where are you seeing the 70 and 80 percent? This is the upper middle class. And this is where we're finding a lot of frustration from people around the world is coming. So one of the big fears is that when the lower middle class and developing middle class hits that part, what happens to the world? Well, mass chaos, that's what happens. So when you combine this with urbanization, we're really starting to see um, a lot of change in the world. And this is where the rising power of uh, mayors comes. And actually, I want to go back. Um, you know, the, a lot of the revolutions we're starting to see around the world, and I'll talk about some populism in a little bit, is because of that elephant chart. And we're seeing people like Donald Trump become in power. We're seeing people like Marine Le Pen, um, Kurtz in Aus Austria, because the, the lower middle class or the, the middle class are really frustrated in those places in the world. And so then with that becomes a different dynamic, right? Which becomes some of that suburbia versus the urban dynamic. And we're having this a lot in our country. What's, what's one of the hottest topics today? Like literally today, sanctuary cities. So why do we have sanctuary cities? Because we have mayors like Rahm Emanuel, like Bill de Blasio, who are saying, I'm actually not completely aligned with my nation state. I'm not aligned with my president. And actually, I'm going to represent my constituency, which are the people of my city. Um, Mayor Khan is another good example. If you have 23% of UK's economy coming from London, and they only get 12% of the Brexit vote, they feel like that's something uneven. So we're starting to see this interesting shift of power where mayors are saying, I don't necessarily have to listen to you. Um, I, have, I have to represent the people in my city. But at the end of the day, the nation state is not dead, I have to say. Um, while there is rising power of cities, you know, we're also very dependent on our other uh, institute or our, <coughs> our other states. Um, example I like to use is actually New York State. So if New York City succeeded from the state, do you know what our biggest problem would be? Water. We get the water from the state. So if we don't have access to water, then we can't fully function. So the nation state is not dead. Um, we're also seeing interesting examples like Singapore, which is featured in this picture here, which is a nation state and a city. And we're finding that in the smart city space, they have a particular advantage. Some of this can be around workforce development and training. Some of this is just about pure efficiency um, and lack of bureaucracy and the ability to uh, work together and solve problems quick, more quickly. So uh, populism versus new, new localism. Um, so as we see, start to see um, uh, cities change, we're also starting to see people uh, work together in a different ways. So uh, one of our advisors is a guy named Bruce Katz. Bruce was at the Metropolitan Institute at Brookings. Um, he wrote, recently wrote a book called New Localism. And it's looking at how different groups, very much in the sense of Habermas, of how different groups behind the scenes start to get together to work together to solve their own problems rather than necessarily having to count on the government. And hopefully this goes in line with today's t theme of, of new democracy. Um, and so Bruce looks at a lot of different examples of the world and says, how can public sector, private sector, and even academia all work together, mobilize, and solve the future of problems? And so we're starting to see a shift in that. And some of it is around innovation, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit, which is what we're doing here in New York. Um, some of it is around education. Some of it is around healthcare. But we're starting to see these very different types of multi-stakeholders work together to solve problems. Also with new locus, localism needs, means new leadership. So obviously, as we have revolts and we see people like Donald Trump and we see people like Marine Le Pen get into, or you know, ha have strong campaigns, we're also seeing new, new leaders emerge. And new leaders who are representing different, um, different people and, and let's be honest, groups like the millennials. So obviously I have AOC here um, and we're starting to see new leadership come into power and try to be representative of this new type of, of um, citizen. 
So at CivLab, we're, we have a theory of change. Cities are the, lo uh, the locus of humanity's challenges and by extension, the laboratory for their solutions. Sometimes we say that cities are the new laboratories and citizens are the new scientists. Also going back to Jane Jacobs saying, you know, cities can only be for people when they're built by people. Um, and also, we really believe that humanity's future rests on urban innovation, looking at how that 70% of the world will live in cities in the future and how can you accommodate for them. Um, we also believe they're hubs for innovation. Uh, we've seen this in New York as the rising innovation economy has occurred here. This is where a lot of the jobs are, are happening. Um, and so we're trying to look at combining those. How can you combine cities as hubs for urban innovation and solve urban problems at the same time? Uh, one of the biggest strengths of New York is that we're a diverse city, and that is diverse by multiple meanings of the word diverse in, by stakeholder type. So we're very strong at a lot of different things, all those groups I mentioned before. Um, we're diverse by ethnicity. We're diverse by our various different neighborhoods, and cities can benefit when they leverage that diversity. So what does urban innovation mean? It encompasses technologies, business models, infrastructure policies, financing structures applied to city settings, and pursuit of economic, social, and physical sustainability and prosperity. Uh, you know, it's not just about technology or even solutions and programs going into our schools and working with um, various different groups, but I think that, you know, the financing structure is a really, really important piece of it as well. There were 2,000 lighting projects. Lighting got a, was a very big trend in smart cities. And not only is it providing LED efficient lights, but also they're providing sensors and you're able to collect data, whether that's you know, data of people walking in the streets or uh, data on sound or gunshots, et cetera. Um, but one of the problems we're having and we're seeing is the, finan the financing models for them. So if you have solutions, solutions can't be scaled unless, unless they have sustainable and scalable financial models behind them too. Those 2,000 lighting projects that were deployed, not two were financed the same way, which makes me ask why. Um, and that this is something that's holding us back a lot. So as we look at urban innovation, I don't just want to think about the technology piece of it, the artificial intelligence piece of it. I want to look at all pieces of the puzzle. So these are some of the areas that we work on um, as we do, as we look at urban innovation. Mobility is obviously a huge one, um, getting from A to B, housing, infrastructure, energy, wa wastewater, uh, urban agriculture. Um, but social equity and accessibility are uh, very horizontal throughout those. So what do I mean by that? So as we look at cities, these are really the verticals that we're trying to um, attack. However, Throughout all of those, we need to make sure that we're socially equitable and accessible. And what do I mean by that? So by accessible, and we spoke about, or Tomer spoke about in the last, in the last discussion, um, we've actually been doing a lot around accessibility. Part of it is accessibility, looking at how do we make the experience for people with disabilities better. Um, one of the coolest just examples that I had the other day, I was with C2 Smart, which is an NYU Autonomous Vehicle Center. And they're looking at when a person crosses the road, a vehicle can talk to a device that will talk to their phone, and the blind person will know that there's a car approaching. So we're leveraging you know, our technologies to make our environments more accessible. Um, one of the other kind of anecdotes that I love about accessibility, and, and it just made me think of it in Tomer's talk, was we're not designing enough uh, um, around accessibility. And if we do design around accessibility, it's not just beneficial to uh, you know, people with disabilities, it's beneficial to everybody. So the example I got always to give is talk to text. Who, does anyone here use talk to text? Where you just go to your phone and you say something? Well, that was created for people with disabilities and now all my eight-year-old cousins, that's all they do, right? Um, and so it's a good example on how we need to think better in the design process to ensure that um, things are more accessible. Now, but accessibility doesn't just mean technology. Um, one of the big problems we're having is mobility deserts. Another one is Wi-Fi. Think about the single mother who is in NYSHA housing in Red Hook. She has to walk 45 minutes to a train. Then she gets home. Her, they, she hasn't been able to help. She gets home at 8 p.m., hasn't been able to help her child with their homework because they don't have Wi-Fi. So we're running into other problems with accessibility, and those are mobility deserts and, and lack of mobility options and transportation, as well as Wi-Fi accessibility. Um, and going back to Jane Jacobs, you know, when we think of places, especially very complex places like New York, social equity is a huge one. Uh, I think this is why we ran into a lot of problems with Amazon, um, and I can talk about that in a little bit. 
So survival and power are driving new localism. I think you know we've been talking about power, and I think that is definitely one of one of the areas. But I think survival is too. Um, as we saw, here's a picture of Mayor Bloomberg during Hurricane Sandy. Um, as we saw, our our ability to respond and to understand that our um, focus on being resilient and sustainable over the long run is going to be key to our survival. So post Hurricane Sandy, we really saw a lot of investment going into areas like resiliency and infrastructure as well as technology. Um, and a lot of that, I must say, was because of Mayor Bloomberg. One of those initiatives is the Urban Tech NYC initiative. I was um, one of the founding members of the team for Urban Future Lab. We're the first urban tech incubator in the United States. Uh, we worked with solutions that were hardware, software, and business model innovations, all reducing carbon emissions in some way, shape, or form. It's still there after seven years. I think they've, while I was there for over three years' time, we uh, raised $150 million or $160 million for startups that got regenerated in the, in, to the New York City economy, which created about $200 million of economic impact um, and created about 170 jobs. So those are tax-paying jobs off of $1 million investment from the city. All while, all while solving problems um, and, and those of reducing carbon emissions. Since then, that program has been expanded. They have New Lab, which is um, a, a hardware incubator, the most beautiful incubator I've ever been to, and that's in, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in, in um, Brooklyn, as well as uh, Company, which was formerly named Grand Central Tech, and it's an incubator focusing more on IoT and software. But all of these spaces are focusing on solving urban problems. Since this investment, we now have about 10 incubators and accelerators in New York City, all focusing on solving urban problems. So as I said, this also, this also means a new workforce. This is actually a picture of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, this is 300 acres. Uh, this is where the first ironclad ship for the Civil War was built, uh, where all the ships for World War I and World War II were built. At one point, 70,000 people worked here. Then in the 1970s, only 70 people worked there. Now we have about 5,000 people that are working there, um, and I think they'll have 15,000 by 2018. And we're starting to see um, you, the, the city and the state leveraging spaces like th this to do new things around manufacturing and other areas that um, will be really strong in the future. So while we talk a lot about the new localism and, and how you know, groups are working on the ground, um, there's also an element of, of the world. And Saskia Sassen, who's up at Columbia, says cities are global by nature. And we really take this to heart. And what my company and my organization do think about how can we still maintain these elements of new localism and understand the importance of working together on the ground, but also understand that we do live in a world that's dominated by globalization. Um, <clears throat> and what we're starting to see is that there's an ecosystem coordination failure. Um, and actually, I remember now what the <laughs> why I had this slide here. So um, I jumped ahead a little bit. So uh, the reason I have cities are global in nature, at the Urban Future Lab, we started to incubate uh, companies from abroad, so we brought in companies from the Netherlands, Germany, the UK, and if they're solving problems that the city of New York are having, we're happy to have you come, especially if they're creating New York jobs. Um, ecosystem coordination failure, we're still seeing that um, the ecosystems locally can be very siloed. Um, this is kind of an example. I named those stakeholders before. So what we started to see that was our New York ecosystem had a lot of great strong actors, but they weren't working together in an efficient and smart manner. Uh, so um, by harmonizing the ecosystem, we're able to create value. Um, and I'm happy to share this deck if I'm moving really quickly to anyone in, in the audience afterwards. But as I said, these are some of the stakeholder groups that we look at that play an important role in our ecosystem. So we are a central platform to coordinate urban innovation ecosystems in cities. We build communities, partnerships, and networks that improve city life and scale solutions globally. Uh, the outcomes of our work are jobs, growth, sustainability, resilience, city services, livability, et cetera. Um, and the program we're now running is with the city of New York. It's called The Grid. So it's taking that, that um, theory of harmonizing the ecosystem and all its stakeholders to try and understand the problems cities are having create solutions for them, and then also scale them. This is a picture from our launch event. This is our steering committee. We have 70 members. We have groups like the Queens County Library, and we have groups like the World Economic Forum and the Department of Defense. 
Um, and we all work together and we think of it as commercialization and look at where can we partner, whether it's collecting and analyzing data or actually doing pilots and demos for the next great innovations. Um, our organization is looking for expansion beyond NYC. We're actually working with a number of cities like Amsterdam, Helsinki, and Detroit. Um, and you know we'll be rolling in, out in other cities in the US and hopefully globally in the next couple of years. And our idea is that it takes the city to work together to come up with the solutions, but it takes a global community to scale them. So if I have a problem in Cairo and a, a solution in Chicago, it's not necessary that you have to have a mayor and mayor speak. It's actually more necessary that you have these robust ecosystems and communities participate in it, just like we saw when we brought companies from Netherlands and, and the UK. Um, this is how we see the world. Hopefully we can help uh, for best, better integration between the global south and the global north. Um, we're actually working with the World Bank and that's one of the one things that they're really keen on. And um, in North America, these are the cities we're looking at. Our first round global, global these are some of the cities we're looking at as well. Um, I went through that really quickly, but I'm happy to answer any questions and share the deck. Uh, it's been a real privilege, thank you. Yeah. No hard ones. <laughs> Did we turn off the lights on purpose or? Sure. Go ahead. So you mentioned that uh, we now have sanctuary cities, right? And everybody likes that idea. But now we're having sanctuary counties out west. The sheriffs are not following the gun laws that are made in the city, which is liberal. And the sure. County is conservative. And you can't run a country like this, either in either direction. I agree. There's one thing that's pro-abortion, another thing that's anti-abortion. What's the answer? A new president. <laughs> well, this has been going on no. Um, I mean, we can look at total, I mean, that's part of the problems with, the, with, with having a governmental structure like the United States and having federal, state, county, and city, right? I don't think these are necessarily issues that we're seeing in, in other places in the world. Um, I don't have a solution for that. Um, I think it's, it will be interesting to see where the world is going. Like I said, I think it's mostly moving to cities, but you might have wild, wild west scenarios in, you know, some of these other places. Yeah. I, I have make very mixed feelings about it. I, I, you know, Venice is the infrastructure is just completely falling apart. It might not be there in a hundred years, right? So I understand that part of it, but also, eighty or ninety percent of its economy comes from tourism. So I think it kind of depends on on every place. Um, I would never say turn your back towards tourism. Um, you know, I'm someone who likes to travel a lot, uh, but, you know, uh, at the end of the day, if it's what's best for the city, then, you know, I, I, guess it, I think it depends city by city. If it's just to say we want to have, we, we want to be tribal and siloed off from the rest of the world, then it's not very cool of you, but then we'll see what happens with, I don't know, international trade and it's et cetera. because there is already a coalition of a few cities like that. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, well, that would be an interesting one, too. I saw someone in the back. Oh, go ahead. Well, I think kind of the big elephant in the room, certainly for New York, and, and I don't see, like, I think, I've never met a New Yorker who's <coughs> anti-tourism. I don't right. think we have that problem. But the whole Amazon issue yeah. is a really, was really Amazon. shocking. Yeah. 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 Amazon yeah. Is, is the big elephant in the room yeah. because it was shocking. And I actually like, and, and now they're going back and seeing that even in AOC's own district, yeah. in fact, 65% of people wanted Amazon. So I, I think that there, there's something to be really, because this is so appropriate for everything sure. to do to explain. Like, so our, our perspective was, and, and actually what we've been telling a lot of companies is, if you don't want to be Amazon, join our program, be part of the community first, right? And that was one of the issues is Amazon just kind of came in. Um, I, I'm somewhat indifferent in the situation. There was a lack of good communication in that situation. So the NYC EDC, who I work with, was the main um, uh, you know, organization that were working with Amazon to bring them here. And they gave Amazon a deal. 
Now the deal they gave Amazon was no different than any deal they give any company. It was no different than the deal that my companies from the Netherlands got, that my companies from uh, the UK got, who have five people, right? What happened is the governor came in though, and he laid on a bigger deal. And then what also happened was politicians came in and saw it as an opportunity to get up on a soapbox. So, um, you know, who knows what would have happened. I think that if, you know, New York was able to actually implement that and have them come in and make sure that people from Queens were part of it and not that they just looked like they were part of it or like they, not that the people from Amazon just looked like they were from Queens, um, then it could have been a great thing for New York.